So I'm excited for this next session, a conversation with Chris Saka, managing partner at Lower Carbon Capital, a judge on the popular CNBC, uh, CNBC, show, CNBC show Shark Tank. I was just watching that last night. And uh, Chris is an accomplished in, uh, venture investor, company advisor, and entrepreneur managing a portfolio of countless technology, communication, and consumer product, product startups through his firm, Lowercase Capital. Alongside his wife, Crystal, Chris grew lowercase, primarily known for its investments in early, very early stage technology companies like Twitter, Uber, Instagram, Twilio, Docker, Optimizely, Blue Bottle Coffee, and Stripe into one of the history's most successful funds ever. These days, Chris heads a science and investing team at Lower Carbon Capital, pursuing the world's most ambitious solutions to the climate crisis that is happening to all life on the planet. Across the realms of energy, building materials, transportation, food, industrial chemicals, reforestation, and all of the underlying logistics, Lower Carbon is showing the world that focusing on climate solutions is, is just good business. In parallel with this work, Chris and, Chris and Crystal have become some of the nation's most prolific supporters of nonprofit climate research. So uh, Chris, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, hey, thanks. It's good to be here. It's actually strange to not be in Jackson in person, so I apologize because, as you know, we live in Jackson full time. Uh, and so it, it means a lot to me to see an event like this uh, taking place, and next time we'll convene in person, but taking place in the heart of a place that we love so much. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we're really psyched to have you with us for this discussion. And uh, why don't we just jump into it with, uh, you know, some things that I think are certainly on my mind and on, in our audience's mind. And I'll just jump into the big one. Um, you know, so you have a great track record in picking winners that, you know, generate good investment returns, uh, making uh, uh, strong bets early. But uh, investing in climate definitely does not have that reputation. I can just remember myself actually back in 2015, I, you know, took a what for me was a decent pot of money and I put it all into solar company and in six months that money was all gone. And so I sort of, you know, felt like I had a really bad personal experience in climate investing. But, you know, I, you're convinced that this time around things are different and that it's not just going to be the right thing to do, but it's also going to be a good business opportunity. But why are you convinced of that? Um, why are you convinced that you found a good space to invest in? Yeah, I mean, I think so much has structurally changed. And I say this as someone who's been a student of the space. I mean, back 20 years ago, uh, I was responsible for buying clean energy at a company where I was the third, I, I was kind of the largest power consumer in three American states. And so it's something that's been on my radar for a long time. And I saw those initial attempts at investing in the space. And there were two things that were different back then is one, it was just really friggin' expensive to build and launch anything because you needed so much CapEx up front. And two is that those original investment business models depended upon regulatory and government clearance and subsidies to go ahead and even have a chance of being successful. So when Kleiner Perkins launched their fund, they were investing in companies that were very capital intensive. And at the same time, they staffed up and brought on Al Gore and Colin Powell because they needed changes in Washington for those things to happen. And by the way, if you look back, those investments actually ended up being profitable. They just took a lot longer than anyone had originally planned on. But what's changed is the same kind of stuff we saw happen in software, was that originally when I first got into technology, you needed a multi-million dollar development environment before you could start coding. You need an Oracle database, and a Sun Microsystems station, you needed to build out your own data center, or at least buy racks within somebody else's. I remember in my early startups I worked in, even the sales team would, when it was time to move data centers, have to put servers in their trunks and move them from one facility to another. And so then what we saw was in around the 2005 timeframe in software, with the advent of cloud hosting, with cheaper, ubiquitous internet, you could even type from a cafe, with so many open source tools, the barrier to entry for startups had come down precipitously. And as a result, this burgeoning field of all of this potential investment came up and the cost and the risk of that initial investment came down from millions and millions of dollars initially to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that kicked off a wave of household name companies today. So when we first started looking at climate as something we would spend full time on, I didn't actually think of that as part of the initial thesis. I assumed these were gonna be much more capital intensive companies because of course, so many of them have physical facilities and research labs, et cetera. But as we started doing the work, what we realized was that 
they benefit so much from advances across the industry, whether it's computing power, where our companies can access teraflops of compute without having to build out an entire data center like I used to have to do back at Google. With, I mean, I used to drop 150 megawatts onto the grid to build out $2 billion worth of servers to go ahead and power our search results. And I had those sprinkled all over the world. Now our companies can access, literally startups can access that kind of compute power for minutes, for hours, without having to invest all that capex and do all kinds of machine learning that have advanced the science they work on. In bio labs, we see the same thing. They don't have to have the entire lab themselves. They can come in and use it on a short-term basis. The cost of gene sequencing has come down faster than Moore's law. And as a result, what we're seeing happen in CRISPR is just incredible. The renewable energy has come down so fast to where we have companies that are actually using clean energy and sometimes getting paid to take it off the grid and use it. And so these structural changes have, have happened. And in the meantime, the other thing on the other end that's happened is now with the cost so low, our companies can have a direct relationship with their buyer, a direct relationship with the retail consumer, a direct relationship with business, and a direct relationship with government as a buyer. And they don't need any permission or subsidy to make this work. They're able to present a better, faster, cheaper, easier to use, cooler, more delicious option without needing that boost anymore. And so the overall economics have changed. And it's funny, we, we have an investor who asked us a question about this, a long time lowercase investor uh, that's a regional ag bank, um, not a particularly innovative bank, just a traditional regional bank. And they asked us, hey, aren't these companies more capital intensive? And I basically gave them the answer I just shared here. And then they laughed and said, actually, that was a trick question. We've been lending to these companies. We know exactly what, they, what their balance sheets and what their income statements look like. And that's been the interesting thing is that the costs have come down so much and these companies get to revenue so much faster than even web and app companies do that they're actually bankable by traditional banks with non-dilutive financing, meaning debt that doesn't take up more shares on the cap table. And they're bankable to go ahead and scale their operations that way within traditional financial models. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still a shareholder of Uber. Uber spends hundreds of millions of dollars a quarter trying to convince people to use it rather than Lyft or DoorDash, et cetera. But these companies that we're working with in climate get to revenue so much faster and an objectively better product. I mean, we have a company that's making industrial chemicals right now using enzymes instead of petroleum as the base product. 50 to 60% margins and approaching a nine figure run rate. And the people they sell it to probably don't vote the same way the founders do, but they ask two questions. Is it the same chemical and is it cheaper? Well then hell, I'll buy it. And so <laughs> it's just been amazing to see this sea change in this industry that's made this new type of investing not just possible, but wildly profitable. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's amazing. And it, it does sound like there have been a huge number of differences just since I, you know, sort of tried to invest in the space myself and had and sort of learned some lessons from the process. Uh, you know, lower cost, of, you know, lower barriers of entry, uh, more bankable and all the rest of it. So, you know, when you're looking um, out there and you, I think, probably have a better vantage point than most in terms of some of the exciting things that are coming down the, the pike. And when, you know, for a, an event like this, and uh, any other climate change event, there's so much discussion about the urgency. Like we need things like right now because the situation is dire, the clock is ticking. So like, you know, I'm sure you're seeing a lot of really promising technologies out there, but you know, looking five years out, 10 years out, do you see some, what are some titanic shifts that you see occurring where you, where, you know, uh, something could be with us, which, was, which would make a huge impact in reducing carbon emissions, and we aren't experiencing it right now, so we might not think like, oh, that's never gonna come. But like, you know, what, what do you think some of those uh, tipping points and like really dramatic breakthroughs could be in the relatively near future? Yeah, well, we see, I mean, we, we have to break this up into two things. So to your, the first part of your question, and in concert with basically what everyone said this morning is that, yeah, we're super effed. I mean, this situation should have been dealt with decades ago. It hasn't been for a variety of of, uh, of political reasons, et cetera, but we are playing massive catch up. And so at lower carbon, we believe a couple of things. One is that markets have the power to help fix this thing at scale and long-term, but we don't have enough time to sit around and wait for those markets to catch up. I mean, as, you, as everyone knows, and the scientists on the call know better than we do, 
that even if we dropped emissions to zero today, we're still going to have massive, massive problems. And so in that, in that sense, we take two parallel approaches, which is, you know, and, and to borrow from something that John Arnold often says, markets work most of the time. So we think if we present better options to take the 7.7 billion people who don't now buy products and services, taking climate into account, if we just give them cheaper, better options, we can convert them into unwitting hippies and tree huggers by basically just presenting them something that's better. But in the meantime, we need to do stuff that buys us time. And there isn't necessarily a building, a, a business model around that. But so we work a lot on geoengineering, planet healing and solar radiation management research. We just, we know that that stuff is gonna have to happen. And we, you know, I've, I've personally been admonished by Al Gore for that kind of work is presenting a moral hazard. And I'm like, it's not an either or, it's a both. And I actually think one of the greatest privileges in life is to sit here and say, we shouldn't spend any time on it. I think that is something that is particularly easy for a privileged, safe class to say, when you think about the people who are really vulnerable right now, the hundreds of millions of people around this planet who live in low lying areas, who are living day to day, who are trying to survive in areas that are gonna be subject to more drought, more famine, water shortages, the resulting war and mass migration. is a truly global problem. We continually understate the urgency. Even the most dire models we ever had didn't take into account what's happening as the permafrost retreats and releases methane, what's happening as the glaciers are melting, but the water staying on top and absorbing more solar radiation. And so we are absolutely going to have to pursue active climate intervention, which by the way, we've been actively intervening in this climate for a couple hundred years now. So humans have a responsibility to un-F all the stuff we've done at this point. And so we have nonprofit stuff we do to try and to advance and normalize that kind of research. Like solar radiation management is scary, but it'll be really scary if we wait till the last minute and wait till a rogue state launches a missile and blows up a dust cloud using the wrong particulate. And we don't know what the outcomes will be. So we need to have best practices, transparent, multilateral approaches to this, but we absolutely need to do it right now. And so we're proud to support not just solar radiation management and the albedo layer, but to also think about cloud brightening, to think about weathering, to think about algae, the, all different types, because we're absolutely gonna have to do this. And afforestation is part of it, but not the only thing. It has to be a multi-pronged approach. But in the meantime, as we look at every sector of emissions around the wheel, and we try and pay attention to all of them, energy, transportation, industrial chemicals, materials, uh, uh, food supply and ag, like literally we go all the way around and look at each of these, you know, the way we use land use, uh, we, we try and find where are projects right now that initially might be unfundable. I mean, that's the business we're in. We're in the risk business. So we'll back people before that business case might ultimately be there. And, and we'll take that risk. I'm in the business of being wrong. I'm wrong a lot of the time when I'm right, I'm really, really right. And so when we look at the total addressable markets though of the companies we're building, they can best be pictured as the whole damn planet. So if we change the way energy is generated and delivered and distributed and stored, then those are multi-trillion dollar companies and they a sea change in how we all operate. So we pay a lot of attention to what's happening with the electrification and the decarbonization of the economy. So we pay a lot of attention to batteries. We try not to be religious about any specific approach Obviously lithium is core to that. And so we have a company that will likely be the largest lithium miner in the world within four or five years. Um, and that's because they do it with 99% less water and 5,000 times faster than a traditional lithium miner. Uh, we do a lot with energy stores though that aren't necessarily lithium based, like big piles of magma heated salt uh, that are thermal stores that take power and, and non-peak demand times. And so we know that is going to be a big driver of economic development and just how we're gonna get around the planet. I mean, we, we have an electrified airplane that's coming to market. Um, and that's, by the way, another example that harkens back to your first question. When we backed that company, Hart Aerospace in Sweden, it was a team of one. Uh, and it seemed crazy. We we're looking around the room like, can this guy really bring a fuselage uh, and powertrain to market? And as we reference checked him and asked other people, of course, the Boeings of the world were like, no, no effing way. It's just not possible to do that at scale. Well, fast forward a couple of years, his entire team can fit inside his 19 seat plane. They've had a, 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 a powertrain demonstration, billions of dollars in orders from all of the majors. 
And it's incredible what's possible now. Why? A lot of that was modeled in a computer first before they ever actually put a part together. And now we're going to have an incredibly capable regional airplane that is that the, the majors are pursuing not because they're trying to greenwash. The scale of these purchase orders is huge because it's just a better option for them. It's more efficient, easier to operate, less exposure to the tumultuous energy markets, fewer moving parts, less downtime, easier to maintain. And so this is the change that we're seeing. So we see that across what's happening in agriculture too. I mean, like I, I don't mind eating beef, but it's friggin' expensive to ranch. It takes a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of feed, a lot of antibiotic intervention, let alone the methane that's coming out on the other end. And you know, it's 82 times worse a greenhouse gas than carbon. And so we have been working on cultured meat that's actually meat. It just never had eyes or hooves. I'm really <laughs> proud of what's happening there because we don't necessarily want to dictate a new diet to a population that's craving that kind of protein, particularly as we see a burgeoning middle class around the developing world. But at the same time, we just know the planet can't sustain the way that agriculture is done today. We see the waste that happens in the fertilizer market right now. And so working to enhance soils naturally using fungus, et cetera, and just smarter farming practices has been a huge boost to farmers. And again, farmers that we probably don't share a lot of politics with, but who see a direct financial incentive in employing some of these smarter techniques as they run their, their operations. We look around transportation. You know, we have a hydrofoil cargo ship that uses, it has a carbon footprint, but what it's displacing is air. And so you need your iPhone to come over from China. We can get it there in three days by boat versus overnight by plane. Still has a footprint, but gets there a lot faster. And so we're starting to see displacement technologies where sheer greed is actually powering this. And I mean, look, we know, and I, you have multiple speakers who know this better than we do, but you know, even the famously liberal rag Bloomberg wrote yesterday about how solar is just cheaper now. Wind is just cheaper. It is just cheaper than coal and oil and that gas. Like that's the reality of it. When I sit down with the head of Goldman Sachs, you know, this is not someone who is making decisions based on any climate guilt or shame. Goldman Sachs is trying to do the best they can to deliver returns for their investors and their shareholders. And when I, when I talk to them about backing off of guaranteeing Arctic drilling and instead investing that in clean energy, they do that not for the warm and fuzzies, but they do that because that's where the money is. And so across each of these sectors, we're just seeing these incredible sea changes. You know, we're gonna see a transformation in building materials. We all know the footprint of concrete, but the transformation's not gonna happen because the world's largest builders feel bad about that. It's gonna happen because we can give them stronger, more resilient, easier to make concrete that can happen. Same with steel. Like we're making clean steel at room temperature with ambient pressure now using often power that we're paid to take off the grid. Like, <laughs> That's a stronger steel that will be that will be used by by builders because it's just better, and and so that's what you know. I mean, as, as we think about the state of Wyoming where I live, I love when I see windmills go up, and when I see solar panels grow up, and when I see people start driving hybrid cars because to me that's done sheerly out of self interest. Nobody's trying to make a political statement with that kind of stuff in Wyoming. <laughs> we know the local politics and we know how the voting goes. They're doing it because it's just damn good business. And that makes me happy. And that's the trend that we're seeing across this whole industry and that we think will save us, but that's gonna take a while. It's gonna take a while for that stuff to really have the multiple gigaton impact we're talking about, as well as in parallel with the projects we're working on to suck carbon out of the sky and hopefully reflect a little bit of solar radiation too. So we need to buy some time for all these other projects to un-F everything we've done to this planet. I mean, we've been treating earth like a rental car for too long. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, no, I love it. This is super exciting stuff, what you're working on. And um, yeah, I'd like to do a little bit of a Wyoming deep dive. You were just bringing it up at the end there. And, uh, you know, you were talking about how you invest in risk and that's all part of the process, geoengineering um, and, uh, you know, sort of related themes. All these things are going to be necessary. We're going to need these technologies to be on the table. And here in Wyoming, as you know, a really big one, a big topic is carbon capture. And, uh, you know, uh, it's controversial. A lot of people think it's a total waste of time. It's expensive. It's in limited deployment. The state, I think we can 
fairly say, wants to be a national leader in deploying carbon capture solutions. And uh, you know, from my vantage point, I hear mixed things about it. Um, people say, oh, there's no money going into it, it's a total dead end. But then on the other end, you see some like pretty cool stuff that seems to be happening, like direct air capture and on and on and on. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on, um, you know, if things are happening there, um, and if, uh, you know, if, if you think, if you think this is a space where Wyoming uh, should try to lead. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, first of all, I just, I feel bad for so many folks in Wyoming who've been lied to by leaders who've been corrupted by the folks who buy them off. I mean, we are staring down the barrel of dying industries. And I know that's kind of the basis of how this institute got started is how do you make a transition away from coal? Like the sheer economics of it just don't prove out anymore. But the few vested interests have owned the political process, which is just disseminate a bunch of BS to, to the populace. And so they rally around something that is literally against their own self-interest. And I hate that. that, that bothers me a lot. You know, I, 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 I look forward to the luxury of debating some of these policies, but I just hate when I see people preyed upon opportunistically in a political process against their own self-interest. Wyoming has an incredible opportunity ahead of it, not just in carbon capture, and I'll talk about that, but across wind, across ag, there are so many opportunities for this economy. But we just have to embrace the reality that it is this workforce who can easily transition to those same jobs. I spoke to President Biden just a few days ago. And, you know, I mean, he's a jobs guy. He's a Scranton PA union jobs guy. And I said, you know, as you think about green jobs, I was like, imagine those old Super Bowl like a rock commercials. Remember those old Chevy trucks? And it's just like a truck bouncing around, mud flying, sparks going, a guy wiping his brow after a hard day of work and sucking on a beer with his loyal dog nearby. I'm like, that's who green, that's what green jobs look like. Those are those same workers, same trucks, same tools, same Kenny Chesney on the radio, same American flag hanging on the crane at the job site. Those are the same skills. I mean, literally putting carbon back in the ground is running the same pipes in reverse. It is literally the same union workers and they actually make more money for what they're doing. And so erecting a windmill is the same job skill set at the labor level that it is in pulling coal out of the ground. These are literally the same workers. As we put in a solar array, as we put in geothermal, it is the same type of worker. And we need to start embracing that. The way that this has been co-opted away from us it's just crazy that whether you put a Democratic or Republican label on it, these are jobs. This has been the growth engine of the economy. Texas, whether the leaders want to admit it or not, now employs more people in the clean energy industry than they do in fossil fuels. And then they can still kind of keep waving the flag of oil and that gas, but that is a corrupt, and it's just not even like authentically indicative of where the economy is there. And so Wyoming needs to wrap its head around that. And now, we can talk about opportunities in carbon capture. Here's what's amazing about carbon capture. Without the government even coming in to push it along, voluntarily it has become a big opportunity because major corporations need to show, not just to their consumers, but to their employees, that they're taking an active role in offsetting their impact on the planet. I mean, consumers are demanding it and that's great, but if you want to attract and retain the best talent in the world, you need to show you're doing something about what about your role in either worsening or improving this, pro this crisis on the planet. And so the voluntary carbon markets alone have been incredible. Now, how do we actually do that? We can do direct air capture. We can do all sorts of stuff at the point of generation. We can grow super trees. I and mean, we have companies right now that, that have engineered trees with oversized root balls and that are more drought resistant, which are obviously gonna need to be, uh, that are gonna be in even greater demand as we deal with the effects of, of, of these radically changing climates and storms and fire, et cetera. And so Wyoming can be a leader in that. We can be a leader in soils and soil management and soil enhancement. We can be a leader in cleaner livestock management. We can be a leader in nuclear energy. I mean, you asked earlier about what do I see 10 years out that's happening? Like, I don't want to blow any announcements from any of our companies, but Einstein's rolling in his grave right now because net energy out of fusion is possible. Like nobody thought that was possible even a few years ago and that anyone working on it was in a folly. We have not one, but two companies that will probably have something public to say relatively soon about what's happening in terms of net energy production from fusion. And so it's bonkers actually. And Wyoming could be a leader in any one of these. Now we could talk about how to best execute on that. I mean, frankly, Republican states actually, one of the, one of the 
benefits they have is there's a lot less red tape to clear when you want to get to work. And so continuing that attitude of making it easier for someone to operate a plant, to put a, a facility in, maybe we're mining lithium in Wyoming, but making it easier. And then taking some of the state budget and realizing we need to make an investment because we're so dependent upon mineral rights and they're going away. Literally, they're not going away because anyone in Washington regulated them away. They're going away because nobody wants to pay for them anymore. We have all these abandoned wells because they're not worth it to anyone anymore. So it's just a reality. We can get up on stage and trumpet about coal jobs and rally around the flag all we want. But the reality is the money just doesn't support it anymore. And so we need to take money from our state's budget and investment and in, in, invest it in attracting more of these opportunities. And Wyoming is just an obvious lead. It's such a small state in terms of management and it's such a big state in terms of geography. It has a natural advantage. And we have so many different micro geographies we could deploy to this. Very few states have the mountainous regions and, and the opportunity to literally pull lithium out of the ground, have the opportunity for meaningful geothermal, have the opportunity for nuclear, whether it's micro or you know, micro fission or, or or I mean, by the way, I mean, we've, we've recently seen a handheld reactor, like a true, it's, it's unbelievable what's happening in that space, but to be a leader in a fusion opportunity to the wind, I mean, we, I don't think we've said this out loud yet. So I'm, I apologize to my team if I, if, if I'm breaking the confidentiality, but we have a company in Laramie that has completely reinvented the windmill. You wouldn't even recognize that as a windmill yet. It's, it delivers energy to the grid at a third of the cost of a traditional windmill, which is already cheaper than fossil fuels. And so what we're seeing across all this for Wyoming is an incredible opportunity. I mean, half the state is wide open plains with wind blowing across it all day. And so as we make this transition, Wyoming could be an easy lead and generate way more revenue off of that economy than they do today. We just gotta make the move. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, you know, in addition to building the wind farms, we could attract the, the renewable, uh, you know, the industries that want that renewable energy, direct procurement, as you were talking about, um, you know, the data centers that want the renewable energy, the wind manufacturers that have all the jobs that want to be close to the project. So there's all sorts of stuff that can be done with wind. Um, yeah, I could go on with you forever on this stuff. It's super fascinating. And thanks for all that you do. Um, it's exciting to see all that's, you know, in the pipeline and, um, you know, makes me feel sort of kind of a bit more optimistic given this sort of dire situation that everyone's recognizing that we're facing. But uh, we're, at, uh, we're at 30 minutes for our conversation, so I think we're gonna call it a day. Maybe if you have any quick sort of uh, closing uh, thoughts, um, we'd love to hear them. Well, yeah, I mean, I would just make one plea to this entire audience, which is nothing drives me crazier than seeing green on green crime. I, it, it's a pet peeve of mine, but when I see climate folks yelling at each other, it drives me nuts. We're all on the same damn team here. And while we may be focused on a business approach and on a research approach, we need activists in the space and we need policy advancement. We don't think guilt and shame are gonna get us the whole way there, but we do need that awareness. And I'm not counting on government to get us there, but every time that people here move government in that direction, it helps, it doesn't hurt. If government can increasingly become a buyer and if they do wanna subsidize our stuff, you know, every now and then when non dilute when money just falls out of the sky from Europe to one of our startups, that's a win for everybody. It accelerates and advances what we do. So we're not dependent upon it, but it's great. And so I just want to say I'm thankful to everyone who is dedicating their lives to this work. Every single person. You know, we there was a question in the earlier session about recreation. Like, yes, recreation is the one thing that me and my hardcore Republican buddies can actually talk about. And so when Fish Creek ends up having an E. coli problem and the temperature gets too rough, that hits close enough to home that guys start freaking out about it. And so I, I do think that is wildly important. And if we're going to raise a generation of kids who are going to work on these issues, they need to understand, they need to feel palpably the implications for them. So first of all, I really want to thank everyone who's working on this and please be kind to each other and support everyone else, even if you don't agree with their approach. And second of all, I just want to say for those of you who are in the investment community, like the, the reality is I have no allergy to making money. And there is just an incredible business opportunity here. And it's the only time in my life where I've ever wanted to encourage other investors to compete with me. I'm pretty confident in how good we are. But the reality is for your business, for your funds, the, the upside is here now. The lines have finally crossed and there are many, many multiples. This is where the fortunes are going to be made. And the businesses that are built here are going to be bigger than the internet. And so I'm, I'm just blown away by the opportunity. I, the urgency couldn't be more dire, but 
thank you to everybody who's helping with this and spending time working on these issues. Thanks so much, Chris. Really appreciate having you with us. Right on. Thank you, guys.